Okay, welcome to the third example video for the introduction to proof writing series. So this is based off of problems that you might want to practice after the third lecture video. And in particular, we'll be taking mathematical statements and rewriting them in symbolic form. So along that path, we will generally define some open sentences or some statements P, Q, and R as needed and then link them together with the operators and, or, not, the if-then statement, the conditional, and possibly the by-conditional statement, although I'm not sure I have any examples of that built into this. Okay, so let's get started. And kind of as needed, we'll go a little bit overboard, just like uh, for fun. So let's say we start with this one. The integer m is even and the integer n is odd. So I think the first thing to notice is that the statement, the integer m is even, is actually like an and statement itself. Maybe it says that something's an integer in the first place, and then after being an integer in the first place, it is an even integer. And then the statement, the integer n is odd, would also be an and statement itself. And then just to like kind of go all out, let's define these in terms of open sentences. So let's maybe start with this. So let's start with i of x, and that would be x is an integer. And then after that, we can define evenness or oddness. So let's say maybe e of x would be x is even. Okay, so that's good. And then we might say O of X is the statement X is odd. But in fact, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that every integer is either even or odd to note that O of X, that should be an X, is actually just not E of X. So if something is not even, then it is odd. So now let's see if we can rewrite this. So the integer m is even would go something like this. So we would have i of m that says that m is an integer in the first place. And then we have and e of m. So we would read, read this as m is an integer and m is even, which is exactly what's going on in these yellow parentheses. Now let's take care of these blue parentheses. We first need to say that n is an integer, so we'd maybe do that with i of n. Then we need to say that it's odd, but as our discussion before, we know odd is the same thing as not even, so we would say and not e of n. Good, and then maybe put parentheses around this to color code it, and then finally we'd put an and statement between these just to be this and that we have right here. Okay, that's good. So is there an easier way of doing this? I think there probably is, but it's kind of nice to go down the rabbit hole while things are simple and later practice maybe the simplest strategy. So this next one says that M is an element of the closed interval from one to pi intersected with the integers. Okay, so an intersection is really like a logical and. So this one should be fairly straightforward. Let's say we have our statement P is the statement that P is from the interval from 1 to pi, and our statement Q is the statement that M is an integer. Okay, and then clearly what we have here is P and Q. Now let's notice that this set can easily be described as the set containing 1, 2, and 3, just based off the fact that pi is between 3 and 4. But this actually means that there's another way of writing this after we've uncovered that equivalency of sets, which, which would be something like this. So I'm not going to define statements in this case, but maybe we would have m equals 1, or m equals 2, or m equals 3. That's what it means for M to be in this set of three elements. Okay, so here's two ways to do this. One, which is straightforward based off the sentence itself, and then one is based off the fact that we can easily simplify that set. So we've got the number 54 is a multiple of three and a multiple of two. Okay, so I think the kind of nice way to do this might be to do it with an open sentence with two variables. So let's do that. So let's do P of M N, and that is M is a multiple of N. 
Great. Now we can see what we really have here is the number 54 is a multiple of 3 and the number 54 is a multiple of 2. So we can put this together as P54 3 and P54 2. Okay, good. So next we have if the month is December, then there are 31 days this month. So this would be an example of an implication. Okay, so let's look through this one. And not only is it an implication, but it's set up in the nice if-then format. So we know that we need a statement for this month is December and a statement for there are 31 days this month. So I think we can do this just very straightforwardly. Let's say P is the statement this month is December. And let's say Q is the statement there are 31 days this month. And now we can turn that statement into the very simple conditional P implies Q. Okay, moving on. So next we have a matrix A is invertible provided that it is square and its rows are linearly independent. This is another conditional, but now the sentence is not written in if then format. What I'd like to start off with is taking this sentence and rewriting it in if then format. So it's easily rewritten as a P implies Q type thing. Okay, so if you think about all the different ways to write P implies Q or the conditional, then um, you can see that this is one of the ones on the chart. So I would maybe do it like this. So if A is a square matrix whose rows are linearly independent, then A is invertible. And now we can really visualize this as if something, then something. But notice the P statement or the left-hand side of the conditional is an AND statement itself. We have A as a square matrix and the rows of A's are, the rows of A are linearly independent. They're linked together with this whose, but we could like decompose that into an AND statement fairly easily. Okay, so maybe we need three things here. Maybe P would be A is a square matrix. Q would be the rows of A are linearly independent. And then R is A is invertible. And now with all of that prep work, I think it's fairly clear that we have a situation like P, imply, P and Q implies R. Okay, so now we've got another divisibility thing. I think probably, again, we should write, rewrite this in if-then format. So maybe something like this. So if n is an integer and n is divisible by 45, then n is divisible by 9. Okay, I think that's probably good to rewrite this as a conditional. Furthermore, we've got this nice and here. Okay, so I think we can do a P and Q impl implies R just like we did in the last example. So let's say P is the statement N is an integer. Let's say Q is the statement N is divisible by 45. And then we'll have R is the statement that N is divisible by nine. Okay, that's good. And now we're ready to go. We have P and Q implies R as, you know, we pointed out before. Okay. Okay. So last one. And I think this one's interesting because this is a false statement, but we can still rewrite false statements in their logical form. You're just not going to have something that's true. This says if a function is even, then f of negative x equals negative f of x. Of course, this is not the condition for evenness. The condition for evenness is that we have f of negative x equals f of x. We kind of gobble that minus sign out up. Okay, so I think, okay, so let's get to it. Let's say p is f is even. And then Q is the rule that F of negative X equals negative F of X. And what we have here is P implies Q. Now you might be tempted to fix this by saying something like, really what we have here is P implies not Q is the true statement. 
because P implies Q is a false statement like we pointed out before. But this would not work either because functions are not just even or odd. Functions are allowed to be neither even nor odd. So that's something important to keep in mind from time to time. So I hope this was helpful. So next up in this series will be the fourth lecture video, which I think will come out tomorrow. And that's a good place to stop.